On the heels of Always Dreaming's great victory in the recent Kentucky Derby, the Illinois State Legislature heads into the final stretch. Will it be sweet dreams for the state of Illinois or a nightmare? We talk about it this week on Capitol View. Hello and welcome to Capital View, the weekly program where we talk about Illinois state issues, politics, and how it just might affect you. Joining me this week is Andy Maloney, journalist with the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. Welcome, Andy. Good to be back, Bruce. And also Matt Dietrich, a freelance journalist. Uh, he's been based in Springfield and also also does has done some work in Chicago. Uh, welcome, Matt. Thank you, Bruce. Great. We now have less than three weeks to go in the legislative session in Illinois. Uh, and the question on everybody's mind remains, what's going to happen with the state budget, if anything? Uh, so let's try and talk about that first, if we can. However, do you think, in getting a budget passed this late in a legislative session and with uh, an election season coming up in 2018, what do you think? Uh, well, I think there's, there's always hope. If you listen to some of the legislative leaders this week, um, there's clearly still frustration uh, they've been trying to negotiate this, what we've been calling the grand bargain, uh, that deals with um, some some issues that Governor Rauner's administration has put out there, workers' comp, property taxes, and some other things. Um, but And we've also seen some hearings on the actual uh, budget itself, the appropriations. Um, so that process is sort of playing out. But uh, as I said, there's clearly been some frustrations. We heard Senate President John Cullerton uh, tried to initiate a vote on some of those uh, those non sort of budget items, I, I, as he and the speaker would call them. Um, and the Republicans, again, didn't want to go along with the process. Leader Rodonio, the GOP Senate leader, came out and said, we're very, very close, but we're not totally finished with a couple things here. Uh, so they didn't want to move forward on it. Uh, President Cullerton, in a press conference, I think clearly frustrated, but still indicating he's open to continuing the talks with, with uh, Leader Rodonio, the Republicans, and the governor as well. So there's hope, uh, but the, the, the frustration and sort of the grind, I think, is starting to uh, be visible even more now. It's been visible for this entire process, I think, but it's, it's, um, it's coming to the forefront again. Right, and I think that, that one thing that you have seen consistently ever since this thing kind of went off the rails back on March 2nd, mm -hmm. when the governor told the Republicans not to, you know, to pull their votes, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that you've seen over and over again is that nobody wants to uh, pronounce this thing dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, almost immediately after uh, the, the troublesome vote in, or non-vote in March, Governor Rauner kind of became the biggest cheerleader. He seemed to, at every turn, he was the one saying, oh, it's very close, we're just on the verge. Mm -hmm. So it seems like nobody wants to be the one who says this thing is done. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have watched what has gone on in the Capitol, and especially this week, when you heard President Cullerton in some pretty strong terms saying, you know, we got nothing left to give. Mm -hmm. And uh, the governor, is going to have to realize that we need to get a vote on this thing. We need to move it. Mm -hmm. If you've been watching, it it, it it does seem like it's dormant. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, what's it going to take to revive this thing? And one thing that I think everyone needs to keep in mind is, you know, we talk about this grand bargain, and uh, it almost seems at times like we're looking at this as if if this thing passes, Illinois will have a balanced budget. And that's mm -hmm. not the way it is. Right. We're trying to get something through the Senate, through one chamber. Mm -hmm. It has to make it through there. Then it's going to have to go through the House, and who knows what's going to happen then. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to keep all those things in mind. And like Andrew said, you know, there's always hope. And, mm -hmm. you know, people who have observed what goes on in the State House know that you can come, it can be 11.45 p.m. Right. On, Mar on May 31st, and you can get a budget passed. Yeah. It, where there's a will, there's a way. Is there a will, though? I mean, <laughs> uh, that's, well, that's an excellent, excellent question yeah. and the right question. As you said, uh, and I think it's an excellent point that, that should be repeated, is we're talking about just one chamber here. We're, and we're talking about uh, a, a string of proposals uh, where everything would have to line up uh, in both sort of chambers. They would have to eventually come to some kind of agreement. 
and and even the president, President Cullerton, said, I haven't really been talking to the speaker about this. We're trying to get this mm -hmm. through the Senate. Mm -hmm. And as everybody who's been here long enough knows, oftentimes it comes down to what the speaker uh, is, is going to do with some of these proposals, sure. even when it is initiated by uh, President Cullerton. So that's an excellent point. It's it's it, it has been discussed as if it is sort of um, you know just one step away. There's a lot of steps left. And and there's a practical side to all this and. Um, if you look at, you know, the big story of Governor Rauner's governorship, of course, has been we are without a budget now for potentially a third consecutive year, but there have been no budgets for mm -hmm. FY16 and FY17, except in one area. There's always been, K-12 education has always gotten a full budget, both times. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a problem now if the grand bargain uh, if it really does sink this session, um, I think the governor is going to have a real problem because one of the main components of the grand bargain is a new school funding formula mm -hmm. that does away with our unfair system. It's you know everybody knows that our system Everybody's, is unfair. Yeah. It penalizes the low-income school districts because it's so reliant on property tax wealth. If the grand bargain doesn't happen. Um, it's going to put some pressure on the governor to push through another full year of K-12 funding. Uh, he's going to have to do that based on a school funding formula that his very own commission, uh, you know, he had this, this uh, school reform commission that worked for six months yeah. and in February came out with this big report, had all kinds of great recommendations. Nothing has happened. Sure legislatively, at least from the governor's standpoint, you have now two competing bills in the Senate. Uh, the, the governor got some criticism on the Democratic side because his commission puts out this report, but he does not follow up with a bill that he would sign. Mm -hmm. um, if the grand bargain fails, he's looking at having to, uh, if he wants to go for a third year in a row and have schools start on time and avoid chaos, he's going to have to either get a school funding bill through, which, you know, two and a half weeks left in the session, that's yeah. pretty t tough, yeah. uh, pretty heavy lift there. But then he, he might also be looking at, if he does want schools to start on time and he wants to give them a full year's funding, he's going to be potentially pushing for another year of funding on a, a system that he and his commission have just now put considerable effort into showing, again, is completely broken. Yeah. Well, does anybody have the stomach, though, on either side to not have schools start on time? Uh, I know that the Democrats have said no more stop gaps, and sometimes Rauner has also said no more stop gaps. Are they serious about that when it comes to K through 12? If I mean, what are the what's the real in the real world, world likelihood that they would say, oh, we're going to let political gridlock uh, keep the schools closed come autumn? I mean, is it that's is, and that's the game of chicken that's yeah. been going on. Uh, ever since the, the, the budget standoff yeah. started, uh, you know, there's a, the calculation is, okay, who's going to get hurt worse mm -hmm. if, if everything uh, falls apart? And, of course, it's already happening now in mm -hmm. higher education and in the human services network. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you're right, Bruce, nobody has been willing to let it go to where um, if, because if schools don't get their money in, you know, July, early August, if they don't get it then, then there is the risk that they can't open on time. Then you really do have a government shutdown. Then you got yeah. a lot of angry people. Yeah. You got right. angry parents. Right. right. Um, that becomes so sort of the most visible uh, component and sort of the most immediate, at least mm -hmm. in terms of how people yeah. feel, yeah. Uh, problem. And it's the same thing with uh, the, the state worker paychecks, right? Mm -hmm. Those are still going in part because of uh, courts who have ordered it to continue for now. But that's uh, another thing that's sort of made this um, this impasse, this sort of semi, uh, I don't know how you want to phrase it, but it, it doesn't feel like a real shutdown to a lot of people, even though there are a lot of mm -hmm. things yeah. that are going wrong and a lot of people getting mm -hmm. hurt. Sure. I mean, if the schools do shut down, is it there, though, just one constitutional officer who's answerable to every school parent in Illinois? The legislature, they just have their own districts to worry about. I mean, does that portend that a school shutdown could be more damaging to the governor than to anybody else? Well, I would contend yes. Okay. 
Um, and, and I've contended all along throughout the budget impasse that ultimately it's the governor's name <laughs> that's on this whole thing. This mm -hmm. is, you know, Bruce Rauner is the chief executive of Illinois, so I do think it could hurt him. However, it could hurt him more than, sure. than, than it, in anyone in the legislature. Mm -hmm. Not to but, mention school kids, obviously, but go right, ahead. Right, but, and just, but from a strictly political yeah, sense, sure. but you also do have now uh, something that we've never seen before. You have the governor and his supporters putting huge amounts of money into vilifying Speaker Madigan. Will that work? Will, will voters, can they latch on to that enough to, to then penalize the Democrats in the, in the upcoming election? That's that's a but they've tried the that dice. before, have they not? And yeah. what's the definition of insanity? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I think their argument is, well, look at his, you know, approval ratings, right? I mean, the governor, uh, from everything I think we've seen leading up till now, uh, you know, also doesn't have incredible approval ratings. I agree that in general, uh, you've got one governor versus an entire mm -hmm. branch, an entire legislature. Um, and, and he or she tends to wear the jacket for something like this, especially when you can point to a, a definitive start, start date. Say, well, I kind of remember there being financial problems in Illinois before Governor Rauner, but this sort of started once he got into office in some senses, maybe several months afterward that people realize it was going on. But um, I don't think that they will stop trying to, to vilify the speaker, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I feel like it, they believe that that's a winning strategy. They feel like people in Illinois, you know, perhaps more than any other state, know who kind of the de facto leader is in the legislature sure. and can pin things on him. So I, I think they'll continue to try that. But uh, I mean, you saw uh, the the governor was in in public at Chicago State. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all know who he is, and and he oh, got yeah. <laughs> negative feedback as he as he termed it. So um, you know, people are aware that that. Uh, who's in charge, I think, and especially if things go even further off the rails, um, you know, they'll have a clear picture in their yeah. head on mm -hmm. that. I want to come back to Chicago State in, in a second, but first I'd like to talk about uh, what's going on in the House here. I mean, uh, uh, there was uh, some House members that were, they were going to put a letter together. They did put a letter together, and shortly thereafter, uh, the governor meets with uh, 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 the speaker, and the speaker says, okay, I'm announcing a uh, committee of four to talk about non-budgetary items. Is this a committee that's going to be talking about the turnaround agenda? Uh, is Madigan under any pressure from his own uh, uh, caucus to uh, get off the dime here and do something, or at least look like you're doing something? Because I think maybe uh, the perception might be everything's been going on over in the Senate and, and, and the House hasn't really been, been, been uh, taking much of a leadership role or doing much of anything other than waiting. Uh, let's slice and dice that up a little bit. What's going on there? Yeah, well, you had, I, I believe it was 30 House lawmakers who kind of signed on to this letter saying, let the Senate pass something and we'll take it from there. You know, we want to get something done. Mm -hmm. um, I believe uh, one of the reps, I think it was Carol Sente, who said afterward, you know, this isn't a coup, we just want some sort of action here. But um, I'd say that's rare. It's rare for the, the rank and file mm -hmm. to come out and sort of contradict uh, their, their leaders in kind of this open fashion. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, there, there was even before um, the attempted vote on the grand bargain this week, there were rumblings that uh, this was still, the, the grand bargain was still shaping, you know, it was still being put together. They were still talking about it. There was still hope that something could get done there. And um, if, you, if you saw the reactions of both the Republican leaders, House Republican leader Jim Durkin and Senate leader Rodonio, they thought Madigan was just trying to preempt, you know, this reported progress in the Senate and say, well, he just wants to look like he's doing something. Mm -hmm. This is a ploy. Yeah, he's not going to take it seriously. Um, at the very least, we are skeptical. Leader Durkin eventually came out and said, I'll appoint four people as well to kind of match. But hey, let us know in advance what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so I, I think the Republicans- They're arguing about the size, shape of the table. To right, some right. <laughs> okay. in, in essence, yeah. So. I, look, you, I, I think you have to, the, the, the status quo right now is that stuff is, is, is not getting done. And in essence, and, until one of those levies breaks, until state workers are, are, are not on the job, until schools aren't open, uh, I, I think it's fair to remain uh, uh, in, a, in a mode where you believe that uh, uh, 
something won't happen until it does. It's it's a, a fair assumption to make. Right, and and uh, Speaker Madigan has on occasion, uh, for example, with the Thompson Center sale, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, you know, that was one of Bruce Rauner's, continues to be one of his big agenda items, and so mm -hmm. uh, after nothing happened for a while, Mike Madigan announced that uh, I'm going to, I've put together, a, a, we're going to look at we're going to look at the. We're going to work with the governor on this uh, mm -hmm. and do more about it. So, uh, the, the, I think what what happened this week uh, is a kind of a continuation of that. Mm -hmm. Where uh, every every so often, Speaker Madigan likes to show that in addition to because at, at every press conference he says he's he has vowed to work uh, professionally cooperative, and, and cooperatively, cooperatively yeah. Yeah. with with the governor. He didn't say collegially, but. <laughs> 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 So I, I, that's what I sort of interpreted this yeah. as. Is, well, we'll take a look at, at your non-budget items. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll look at them. That doesn't mean we're going to do anything other than look yeah. at them. <laughs> take okay. a gander. All right. Uh, the, the legislature has gotten one thing done, at least so far, and that's House Bill 40. Uh, uh, talk to, to us a little bit about math, about what, what is in House Bill 40, and what does it really mean, if anything? House Bill 40 is a bill uh, that was introduced uh, largely in reaction, well, in completely in reaction to Donald Trump's election as president and some of the rhetoric that was going on around that time regarding uh, Roe v. Wade and, and uh, the future of uh, reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. And what it would do is, number one, there's language in, uh, there's uh, language in the Illinois statutes now that should Roe v. Wade uh, ever be overturned, that we would revert to the pre-Roe v. Wade, so abortion would be illegal. It takes that out, would be illegal, mm -hmm. takes that language out. Uh, also, it uh, would expand uh, Medicaid coverage to include abortion. So okay. low-income women who are Medicaid eligible would have abortion covered. Uh, and the whole thing uh, came about as a result of the election of Donald Trump and a lot of the rhetoric that was that was going on around that time. Um, now, what has happened, uh, and I think, uh, and and I don't want to get, you know, steer everything into the cynical political interpretation of oh, things regarding <laughs> the 2018 election. Feel, feel free. <laughs> what you have going on now, and Governor Rauner ran in 2014 and was elected saying, I am the candidate, I have no social agenda. I'm not an ideologue, I'm not a, right. so, yeah, I'm not a and, and in fact, he was the pro-choice pro candidate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, but he has a problem now with the, uh, he has stated that he's gonna veto this bill because of the Medicaid component in it, that uh, it's taxpayer funded abortion and we, we can't afford that and therefore I'm going to veto but it. But is it fiscal or is it social that he's making his argument? And, and this, is, this is where it gets politically tricky mm -hmm. because uh, obviously it puts him in a bind because um, he, in 2018, he's going to need some of that crossover vote that helped him win in 2014. Sure. Um, but he also, you know, by vetoing this, uh, pretty substantial part of his base is going to support that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that what this bill started as uh, uh, and what it's intended for is to be a reaction, kind of a, a firewall against the D Donald Trump's rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as an ancillary effect, it has for the Democrats who support it mm -hmm. and, and who passed it, it's put Governor Rauner in the hot seat. I don't think that was their intention, okay. but I do think that it is a very, I mean, it's its an effect that, yes, they mm -hmm. they like that it, that it does that. It's going to be so a problem paint, for it. they painted him in a corner just as a, as a side benefit or a side, if you want to use the word benefit, mm -hmm. but that wasn't their true thrust in your view. And, you know, and this comes back to uh, when, when Rauner ran in 2014 and said, I don't have a social agenda. Mm -hmm. I always thought, that's a problematic statement mm -hmm. because no governor in any state can run without a social agenda. If you are elected to office without a social agenda, mm -hmm. you're going to have one handed to you because you can't get away from it. Right. This is an example of that. Sure. Yeah, okay. that, that was a comprehensive summary. I'd just add the, the trigger language that they're taking out is sort of, uh, it's, as you said, preemptive, the, the Trump appointing 
uh, more conservative justices mm -hmm. to the U.S. Supreme mm -hmm. Court in overturning Roe. There is some some doubt, some skepticism as to whether, even if they they don't take that language out, whether abortion would be criminalized or not. But they're in their minds and Democrats' minds, better be safe than sorry. Yeah. You know. Well, what does it say though that that it's passed both houses, but it's not on the governor's desk yet? They've kind of held it back. Mm -hmm. They've given them a little bit more time to think this over. Well, why would they do that? Why not just say, okay, governor? Uh, Let's see your hand. Yeah, uh, if well, you want to take that one, I, I was. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think they probably want to wait uh, until there is something in the news that really makes him think hard about it, or uh, and or uh, is going to cast him in a negative light from a Democratic perspective mm -hmm. by his veto. For okay. example, a uh, Supreme Court appointment or. Uh, some other, some legislation. Um, they're going to wait until it's, you know, so that he can't veto it quietly, where it's going to be as much of a dust up as it possibly yeah. can. Yeah. How much of a sort of Damocles politically might this be to the governor? Uh, is this all in the Chicago area? Because he did do better than expected, I think, in Chicago land. He obviously did very well downstate and, and, and in parts of central Illinois. Is that where, where this issue is most going to be a battleground for the governor politically? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, what's the, the sort of saying sometimes is suburban women kind mm -hmm. of help carry, uh, you know, that race. And so whether they are pro-choice, pro-life, whatever, they're going to be paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's certainly something that he's going to have to think about in, in terms of his next campaign. Um, whether he can successfully, you know, if he follows through on his veto, whether he can make that veto, you know, endure the kind of rush of negative commentary from the other side, negative commentary mm -hmm. from the ACLU, negative commentary from women's groups, um, and then successfully, you know, pivot to something else, make something else the news. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting to find out, but it's something to me that is, is to be determined. Well, since we're on the subject of politics, uh, let's talk about uh, the governor's go back to Chicago State. He recently appeared at the commencement ceremony. Uh, did, was not warmly greeted, I think would be a, a fair, a fair mm -hmm. statement. Why would he have gone and done that? I mean, did, or is, do you think that he was surprised by the reception he got? Yeah, I don't know if he was, if he was surprised, perhaps surprised of the magnitude maybe, uh, but you have to imagine that um, with the, the, the budget impasse hitting universities and in particular Chicago State so hard, uh, folks were going to be aware of that. Yeah. And let's just make sure for the viewers who may not have seen this, a loud chorus of sustained boos. Right. It, it right. Was, there was no ambiguity, right. really. I mean, there were, there were maybe some hand claps there and there, but it was mostly, I think, characterized by uh, negative feedback, as the governor uh, described mm -hmm. it later. Um, yeah. And, and Chicago State, in particular, as uh, as I said, was hit pretty hard and, and had to lay off plenty of employees, mm -hmm. had to cut hours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of all the institutions, they're the one that's, right. that, that's probably most right. in jeopardy here. Right, and so I, Matt and I were talking before the show, it, is it an attempt to kind of go to the lion's den and, and show that you, know, you can make tough decisions and endure the feedback even if people don't like you? I'm not 100% sure, but um, it's, it, it was certainly interesting to watch. Well, and, and Chicago State is an interesting case with, with Governor Rauner. And, you know, the, the higher education in Illinois has really, really suffered uh, under, the, under the budget impasse. Uh, when Rauner first came in, he proposed the budget for FY16 that was gonna cut higher ed by 30%. 30% okay, due to the budget impasse, as things stand today, you're looking at, those universities are looking at 60% cuts over the last two years. Now, the grand bargain had a, an education, com, higher education component in it that would bring that up to like 35% cuts. So mm -hmm. Chicago State has been especially hard hit by that because they rely on state funding for about a third of their funding. The others, mm -hmm. I think you, uh, University of Illinois is like 15%. Yeah. Now, in early 2016, Governor Rauner really, really sharply criticized Chicago State as a, he called it a failed institution. He said, maybe we ought to take all their money away from them, give it to the students so they can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. 
it was kind of an intemperate remark, and, and Rauner is very controlled and on message, and it was very strange that he would kind of lose it like that. Yeah. Uh, now, one year later, in February of this year, Rauner turns around and forms this commission, this task force, headed by Paul Vallis, to turn Chicago State University around. It was kind of remarkable. It was a real 180 for him. Yeah. So uh, for him, you know, he, he got the boos, and I would expect he would get booed like that at just about any public he university. He got booed at the KISS show at the State yeah. Fair. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Come on. Yeah. 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 So, but, you know, if, if there is one public university that maybe would have a reason to applaud Governor Rauner, it, it might be Chicago State because he did put some special effort this year into, you know, it's the only university where he said, we're going to... I'm going to put Paul Vallis in. And we're going to get some experts well, in I here. I can't let that go, challenge. All right. It's the only university where he said, I'll form a committee. Is that, at the end well, of the day, what he's done? Where he really gave some special attention to, uh, let's turn this thing around. And, okay. and, you know, the history of Chicago State made his, his remarks last year even more, um, you know, in my, in my opinion, intemperate, because yeah. that's a, it's a historically... Uh, minority university sure. for an awful lot of its students they are the first members of their families sure. who ever went through college sure. for a lot of people in, in the south side of Chicago it, around yeah. where it's located yeah. it's the only chance they have yeah. for uh, for a college the degree. measuring sticks of the matrices are some mm -hmm. perhaps different there than they might be in in, in, in say UIS or Urbana-Champaign mm -hmm. so um, yeah I mean it, 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 it to me it was very curious that he would go there it was somewhat uh, reminiscent of uh, Trump going to uh, University of Illinois Chicago on the <laughs> campaign trail, not as vociferous uh, a reaction. I mean, the, there was a near riot, and but you're, you're right, we're walking into the lion's den, and and and, and what's to be gained uh, by doing that? Uh, so it, 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 you know, perhaps maybe he's just practicing for for next year, and and and, and perhaps. We'll do it better next time. Uh, and speaking of next time, we're about out of time here on Capital View. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.